Thanks, Dr. Laquette. It, it strikes me as a neurologist that uh, having, we really didn't examine the magnet as an intervention for a traumatic brain injury, but it strikes me that it might have some value, not so much because of the magnet, but because of the football size helmet. Um, I want to take this um, opportunity to introduce Dr. Barbara Vickery. Uh, Dr. Vickery was a consultant member of our committee, a very active one. Uh, she is the uh, professor and vice chair of the Department of Neurology at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she also directs the Health Services Research Program in Neurology. I spend most of my time doing clinical trials and Dr. Vickery spends most of her time trying to make sense of my clinical trials and, and other people's as they're applied to the real world. So uh, we're pleased that uh, Dr. Vickery, who's a newly inducted member of the Institute of Medicine, uh, is here to provide us with an overview of our report on cognitive rehabilitation therapy for traumatic brain injury. Dr. Vickery. Got it. Thanks. So um, before I start into an overview of the report, I wanted to just comment briefly on what the comments that we just heard. Um, I was one of the 20, one of the one out of the 30 people in the room who was not a cognitive rehabilitation therapy researcher. I'm a health services researcher, and I was really thinking about um, uh, what you were speaking to and this task um, in that um, what we do in health services is look at the existing literature and then try to incorporate that and make sure that's translated into clinical practice so that the benefits of the evidence actually occur in the real world population. We certainly take issues around cost into account and value uh, uh, in that kind of research. But it's very much listening to the users, knowing who your audience is, who are the, the people making policy decisions, who are the health systems administrators making those decisions, and trying to craft research that bridges the evidence into what decision makers uh, need. And in this task of, um, I was asked to um, be involved in the, the literature, uh, the, 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 uh, synth the evidence report, because I have some methodologic expertise in, in looking at the literature. And I was thinking that this whole process uh, involves both looking at how do we strengthen the evidence base, but then how do we do it in a way that's really focused and targeted on research that's going to be helpful to that decision maker. So it's it's an interesting task because it involves not just the health services piece, but also strengthening the underlying evidence. Anyway, um, you've um, many of the folks who are on this committee are um, here in the audience, or at least some of them. Um, and one thing I'd just point out, it is a very multidisciplinary group, and as we heard so eloquently, and what I learned in the course of, do, of uh, being involved with this report is that there are a diverse range of um, clinical disciplines that have contributed to the literature on cognitive rehabilitation therapy. And I think we had quite a few of those represented on the committee. So let me just summarize the charge. This is from a year ago. Um, this was the, uh, I believe, the original statement um, verbatim of the charge to look at the studies uh, on CRT, um, assess evidence of effectiveness, uh, looking at both um, mild, moderate, and severe TBI. We were specifically charged to separate these categories. Um, there were good, good reasons scientifically. Um, to try to make some assessment of the current state of the practice, and that is to qualitatively look at where is it being delivered and how is it labeled. Um, and something about who's providing it. Um, and the last recommendation um, on what was currently being delivered, we, we had some discussions and said that's not something we can really assess uh, uh, in this time frame. It was a 12-month duration. Uh, as with all of these reports, I believe there's always several public meetings, some closed meetings, 
an extensive literature review, which I'll describe. All the reports also have external reviewers at the end, again, very a multidisciplinary group of reviewers. And it was released, I looked at my email, about one year ago, a little over a year ago. Um, here's a copy and the framing of the, the structure of the report. Um, and I'm going to focus mostly on what we did in reviewing the evidence, but that introductory material, you see it's a whole five chapters, and I think there was a, certainly a process of of uncovering and disentangling, again, some of the issues you, you heard just now. What is TBI? What are the factors that affect recovery? How do we define what meets the definition of CRT? Because it's not always so obviously labeled. And something about the state of the practice. And then, as with all the reports, closed with some recommendations. Um, this is um, uh, one of the things that, that uh, uh, was pulled together for the report was to go to different organizations and look up what is their definition of CRT. Um, it sounds like this group is very well versed in this, but I, I think that the second one listed here was particular, probably of these, I, I thought was most um, mapped most on to how we looked at this. Um, it's a systematic, functionally oriented service of therapeutic cognitive activities based on an assessment and understanding of that person's deficits. And the services are directed to achieve functional changes by either reinforcing or reestablishing previously learned behaviors or establishing new patterns of activity or compensatory mechanisms. And uh, in the course of um, our first couple of meetings, the uh, committee decide, uh, worked through focusing the research or the, the the questions for the report. Um, and I would say that a lot of what the report focuses on is this first question. And we basically refine this as, do cognitive rehabilitation interventions improve function and reduce cognitive deficits in adults with mild or moderate severe TBI? And I would point out that we were specifically asked, and the literature sort of sorted itself into looking at different cognitive domains. So we didn't just lump everything together. We said, you really can't include literature on memory retraining with something that's addressing social communication skills. Um, but we were also charged to specifically look at different domains. The major ones are attention, executive function, language and social communication, visual spatial perception, and memory. We also looked at some, um, the literature on multimodal or um, CRT that was targeting comprehensively more than one domain. We also realized that we needed to look at, was there evidence of immediate benefit as well as long-term benefit? Did it improve that domain both at a short period of time, but was there a study that followed it out for more months? And were patient-centered outcomes part of the assessment? Uh, did the study only look at did memory improve or memory ability, or did it also look at it reintegration into the community or quality of life? Um, we also assessed uh, any evidence of adverse events or harm. And I guess you could say how initially some of us reaction, how could there be harm? But uh, any review you ought to be looking for, is there any downside to anything that's being delivered? And also, we, we were uh, asked to look at whether there was any uh, evidence about telehealth delivery of CRT. So um, <clears throat> I really like to make models. And this was one that, that uh, John helped me put together. Um, because if you're trying to understand what are, you, what are you analyzing here, and let me just walk you through it, because it's not nearly so bad as it might look. Um, but um, where's the, there we go. So we were trying to think about, here's our domains. Someone has some impairment following a traumatic brain injury. You're delivering by modular. It means that you're focusing on one domain, some sort of CRT that's perhaps addressing memory. One key thing that we had to sort out is, it, was the technique restorative or was it compensatory? And those kinds of studies, we felt like we couldn't lump together. We needed to look at those separately. And one of the key things about CRT and that we uncovered in trying to make sense of this literature is that there's a wide heterogeneity of um, factors of 
folks who are in the trials, and those factors can not surprisingly affect or mediate uh, the, 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 the delivery of the intervention and recovery. So um, in particular, there's certainly a lot of comorbidity, particularly if you're looking at things like PTSD or physical injuries um, that were associated with the traumatic brain injury, um, substance abuse, um, the environmental, the environment the person is living is huge in looking at the context of what does this intervention mean and how successful it was. And those things can vary a lot across studies and you have to think about when you're interpreting what does that finding mean. Um, and then in the end, the goal of that intervention would be can you improve outcomes in terms of activities and then eventually in the person's social functioning and quality of life. Any questions about this model? Looks pretty straightforward. Yeah. In terms, in yes, uh huh. To some extent, and the report summarizes that I think in a more general sense. Yeah, and we I, I've read the report. I couldn't figure it. it out from the report, so I was actually looking forward to asking you the ah. question directly. <laughs> um. We had some discussion. I don't know that we sat down and, and organized the different sets of variables that way. Um, but I think what was, was key was that when you're looking at the literature, there might be three studies or two studies on one topic. And there might be a lot of heterogeneity. And the study might not have addressed, had the power to address, was there a moderating effect or a mediating effect? So we couldn't drill down to that level and in fact one of the the things that we commented on is we think that these factors could be important that's an area of future interest at least some of them but the body of literature didn't allow for teasing them apart even though we know that they're important well I mean it, yeah. it, just just as an example one of the things that I thought was interesting uh, I have the microphone yeah. <laughs> so, if, for example, like you have age as a a moderator of or mediator of effectiveness of CRT, but, but possibly because you have the potential moderator mediator. Mm -hmm. But I I was just wondering why you wouldn't have age also as uh, a variable that is related to the severity of the impairment itself. Because there, I think there's data to show that if the younger you are versus, you know, age is very important in the type of impairment you have due to a head trauma, for mm -hmm. example. But I didn't see it there, but then it occurs much later. And the only reason I ask this is mm -hmm. someone who's responsible for determining the relevance of research proposals, I always get confused on when, how one is approaching things like age, uh, gender, ethnicity, social support, which also can be thought of earlier on in the process versus later on in the framework that, you, that your panel put together. Um. <clears throat> You're absolutely right uh, that those factors are very critical in thinking about how, how effective is that intervention. Let's say that the study was only in older people, you know, or a study was only in young people who were otherwise healthy, or the study had a very mixed population by age. We tried to record that key information in the end, there were, as I recall, never enough studies in any subdomain where there was a way to tease apart. Either they, they didn't do the analysis in the study, if they had variability, or that there were enough, like only in older and only in younger people, that we could 
separately assess that evidence. But you're absolutely, we, we totally were in agreement that there's going to be some key factors here that you would want, if you think they're important to understanding the, the effectiveness of CRT for the population you hope to apply it to, that moving forward you might want to focus in on as you set a research agenda because there wasn't enough information to drill down to tease apart that effect. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions? Okay. So let me just say the approach. There's, and again, that's more detailed in the um, um, report. Um, we developed a search strategy, applied it to a whole host of databases, and came up with 856 articles, initially looking at the prior 20 years and later selectively going back to some earlier dates. We had a set of inclusion and, and exclusion criteria to narrow. And let me just say that one thing that we struggled with was whether to only include randomized trials. And we broadened the study design to include selectively some pre-post studies, non-randomized comparison groups, and um, occasionally some single subject uh, with controls experimental design for certain types of um, um, domains. But we took that into account when we went and looked at the body of evidence and said, what does this evidence suggest? So we certainly weighted much more strongly the randomized trials. Um, there was a final set of 90 studies that had detailed abstraction of key data and reviewed by at least two committee members. They were judged and categorized by the rigor. And we developed a grading system by which to judge the evidence. And the point I want to make is we were grading the body of evidence within a certain category, within a certain domain. And whether it was in an acute phase, a, a, a chronic phase of traumatic brain injury or subacute phase. And we pre prepared detailed narrative and tabular summaries of all the studies that were part of what the committee then discussed extensively in coming to some conclusions about the evidence. So this is actually the final step in thinking about that evidence. Um, and what we did was we said there's either, we're going to grade it in four categories. One is there's no evidence because it's either not been studied uh, or it's um, some evidence, but it's not very informative because the studies were so flawed or otherwise limited. Limited evidence, a one plus meant there was some kind of signal or a result from a single study or mixed results from two or more studies. Modest or a two plus, at least two studies reporting what we called interpretable, and informative, and concordant types of results. And then strong evidence, three plus, which is the classic, you know, uh, reproducible, consistent, large studies, good power, high quality study design. Okay, and I just wanted to walk you through one example so you could get a little sense of how we looked at this. This is in one domain. Remember I said this was done separately. There's a chapter for each of the different domains and then for comprehensive CRT. In the area of language and social communication, there were a total of five studies. Four were randomized trials and one was a non-randomized parallel group study. Again, when we looked at that, we gave more weight to the four randomized trials. If you look over here, so there's the domain. There were only studies of moderate severe TBI, so we didn't have any information on mild TBI in this particular C in CRT interventions in this domain, okay? And there were only studies in the chronic phase. Um, I put six months, I believe that's, uh, yes, it was more than, more than six months um, uh, out. Um, and then we graded the evidence separately on patient-centered outcomes, whether there was evidence of an immediate treatment benefit, that is, improvement in language and social communication skills or functioning at a short time frame, whether there was a long-term effect on that domain, and whether there was any evidence of better patient-centered outcomes, for example, improved social communication, um, uh, in integration into the community or social functioning in the community or quality of life more globally, okay? 
So we graded that evidence, and as you can see, I'm going to illustrate for you, in the area of patient-centered outcomes, it was not informative. There really weren't any studies that told us anything about those outcomes. In terms of an immediate treatment benefit, we actually found this mo moderate or modest uh, 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 evidence of, of benefit, at least in the short term, in the domain of social and, uh, uh, language and social communication skills. Um, but there was, um, for long-term benefit, uh, we found just a couple of studies uh, through six months. So that would get it uh, evidence of a more limited um, assessment of benefit. Is that clear? Any questions about that? So how similar were the RCTs? Were they the same techniques? Um, in this particular area, um, there were um, sort of two kinds of techniques, and I'm not a cognitive rehabilitation therapy person, so somebody who is will, will. Um, one is more directed on social communication skills, and in fact, most of the better studies, the larger trials in this domain were on that particular aspect. And those were more homogeneous across those couple of studies now we're talking about. Correct. And, and in fact, absolutely so. The report details that. Those studies are organized, and there's a clear discussion of the stronger RCT evidence is in this uh, directed more at the social communication skills. And we were able to describe those interventions, which I may have on the next slide. I didn't put, I don't want too many words on the slide. There was sort of a second category here of emotional perceptional uh, interventions. Those were in the very smaller trials, and they were also weakly positive or they were mixed. So overall, though, there were sort of two categories in terms of the heterogeneity of the intervention. And yet there was still a strong enough signal, particularly with the one category of intervention that it, it rated up to a two plus. But you know, when you were describing that earlier, I was thinking, boy, I remember as we were working through that in the review and trying very hard to drill down enough to provide that level of detail. But when we discussed it, we felt like there was good enough evidence um, overall for those two, two forms, particularly for the social communication targeted. Yes, John. Yeah, I just want to I mean, I think the point you're raising is an essential one and one that we talked about incessantly in the meeting. That is, what is the definition of the domain broadly or any specific sub-technique? You know, when you do meta-analyses, you're doing them of the same thing. What's the same thing? I I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in my talk, but it is, I would say, one of the major dynamics that we struggled with. Mm -hmm. if, if I can... Yeah, maybe people, when they also use the language, are so... John White. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Dave Seafew. I, I just, I don't know that the technique thing really pops to those of us that, that do this, because we use the word chemotherapy for cancer care all the time. And chemotherapy isn't one thing. It's, there are techniques for different types of chemotherapy, but we all use the term chemotherapy understanding that the technique is going to be specific to that cancer. So I think those in practice and in research use the term cognitive therapy. Just, it just, it, I don't, I don't think the differentiation in the techniques is quite as, uh, so, quite as relevant. Uh, we're, I, I think we're saying the same thing. Again, this Warren Law, we're saying the same thing. So to move the discussions forward, you know, when you talk about chemotherapy, I think most of us understand that we're talking about chemotherapy that has proven effectiveness. I don't think that this field you know, you can make the same assertion because there are techniques that do and ones that do not. Uh, I, I'm asking for your guidance. I mean, it, it's not, I mean, it's just, I'm saying, how, do, how is this problem best addressed? I, I don't know. So um, I think um, <clears throat> one of the issues, for example, um, one of the studies, as I recall, 
Um, the um, authors was, was pretty nice study. They found a pretty positive effect on the immediate outcomes and they had described, um, I don't know if I have that in the next. So let, let, me, um, let me go through this slide and then, then we'll come to you and let me make this point. So I was trying to illustrate the zero, one, two. Remember, we're, we're talking about was there evidence on patient-centered outcomes, a long-term effect on that domain, and immediate effect on that domain. So the first paragraph here maps onto where there was the zero. We found there was no evidence, it was not informative one way or the other about whether there was an impact on patient-centered outcomes. It wasn't saying there wasn't an effect, just that there wasn't enough literature that addressed it that we could draw a conclusion. In the second piece on long-term benefit, we found limited evidence of a sustained effect on chronic moderate severe TBI. There were two trials that affect uh, sustained effects on social communication skills through one month and six months. That's why I got a one plus. The third group, what was the evidence for an immediate treatment effect? There was modest evidence from a synthesis of findings across all four trials and the one non-randomized trial. We used that to say that that was in the same direction, that was concordant with those, for the benefit of CRT on social communication skills in chronic phase, moderate severe TBI. Efficacious interventions tended to be across these small group outpatient programs employing a standardized protocol for social communication skills training. Appropriate candidates were people who had demonstrated deficits and sufficient capacity to participate in a group program. And that's the granularity that I would think that as administrator you need to, to know. And then I wanted to know as a health services researcher, well, where are those protocols posted? Where are the manuals? Where's the description of and the tools you would need if you were wanting to go deliver that intervention? And that's where we kind of hit a, some people post them after they publish their trial and some don't. So there's, there's an area where there's a, a gap between taking that nascent evidence with a particular standardized approach or similar couple of approaches across a couple of those trials and saying how would you, you know, find that intervention and then go try to deliver it in a larger population, either to study it or because you're saying, gee, right now we don't know what our therapists are delivering or it's a wide range of things that maybe draws something from one of these studies, but maybe it's been adapted so much it's widely different. So, um, uh, yes, go ahead. You have a yeah, I'd like to address that point and also directly uh, Dave Sifu's point. Yeah, Mike Weinrich, NIH. Um, progress in cancer has been achieved through head-to-head -head competitions of specific, well-characterized protocols that anybody can read in the literature so you can actually evaluate what was given to individual patients and yes, they're individualized for patients, but they're individualized according to a specific protocol. And if we're going to achieve progress in this field, we're going to have to achieve the same level of specificity. Um, Dr. Vickery? Yes. Can I, Sorry. Yeah. yeah, this is Mary Kennedy. I was one of the reviewers on the report. Um, and my particular area, I, I ended up concentrating on memory. And so to, to address some of your concerns, um, I think we really needed more studies in a particular area. So if you look at the memory section, there were a number of RCTs in internal memory strategies and um, external compensatory memory strategies. But um, what, what we didn't see across studies was similarity in how those strategies were instructed. And um, there have been um, very few uh, published papers that actually describe in the methodology the um, not just a manual, but how, what kind of feedback, what was the, the schedule of the feedback, not just dosage, but actually what was the dynamic process that we often see in um, therapies describing behavioral um, intervention for depression, for example. So you see more scripts, more protocols, and more of a dynamic flow. Um, we didn't see any of that, and none of the manuals that are currently available actually have that. So one, we actually need protocols and manuals, absolutely. Um, but I think the second thing um, that we were not able to do was um, get into the, the active ingredients or the granulation of the kind of intervention. A, because 
for the most part, it wasn't described. Um, B, you, if you have a group of interventions that have some similarities um, that you can identify, then you, you can separate those out and look at them. Um, we published, we, myself with another group, in 2008 did a meta-analysis of executive functions, and we actually had enough studies where we were able to look at the approaches that people used in instructing the strategy. And when we did that, we did see a significant effect um, for um, in the domain of patient-centered outcomes or very personalized functional outcomes, which was not present to the same extent in the control interventions. But you're absolutely right. Um, this is where we need more replication studies. We need better manuals um, that people can actually follow. And then we can begin to tweak um, and look at cost-effectiveness. So, Okay. Do I? Um, oh, okay. Just, I'm not done yet, but I can stop if you want me to. Ira. <laughs> oh, these are great questions to flesh it out. This is, so I sh showed you the one example from um, language and social function, and this is the overall summary table. Um, and I guess a couple of things to point out again. These are the domains, including the comprehensive. That is something that, that addressed multiple domains, an intervention that did that. Some literature, there was only evidence from moderate severe. Some there was in memory, there was both mild TVI and moderate severe population studied. So we have that. For attention, there was both studies in subacute and chronic. But in others, there was in these, there was only chronic phase. OK, so that's the, the idea. Then here's the three areas of outcomes that we looked at across the body of literature and attention, moderate, severe TBI, divided into subacute patients or chronic phase. And you can see that where there tended to be some evidence of benefit, it was in the immediate treatment effect, no surprise. You do an intervention, you're going to look at whether your intervention made an impact in that domain. Um, fewer studies also looked at long-term effects six months out, and fewer studies overall existed that had patient-centered outcomes. That's why there's more zeros here. You'll see that there's no three-plus box. So there was nothing that met that really strong um, uh, highest level that you like, like to see in um, folks that are doing reviews for guidelines. But there was definitely areas where we saw, again, language and social communication. There's a two-plus set of studies in memory. There's a couple of uh, areas where there's evidence of immediate treatment benefit and patient-centered outcomes, and some others with some limited evidence. Um, just a couple of points about a couple of additional issues. There were, when getting back to the cost thing, there were a set of studies that looked at two alternative forms of CRT as randomized trials, but <clears throat> neither arm had either had efficacy and neither arm was standard of care. So we had to set those aside and say they didn't provide evidence about benefit of either one because we didn't have a comparison either to usual care or to, or, and neither one was separately proven. Um, and that was particularly interesting because those tended to be very intensive, a lot of resources, and if you don't know if either one is beneficial, you know, it, what would you do with that evidence? Um, as we just talked about earlier, real-world patients present with comorbidities, contextual factors that um, uh, can complicate interpreting the evidence. The overall findings, again, there's evidence of some benefit of certain forms of CRT for TBI. It's variable across different cognitive domains, but it's essential that you look separately at the literature in different cognitive domains. There's not enough evidence for clinical practice guidelines. Um, we found no evidence of adverse effect or harm. That's a very important finding. Um, wasn't always assessed in the studies and should be going forward, but we didn't find any, and there wasn't really evidence on telehealth. Some limitations about this extent body of research, we've already discussed some of it. Um, the active ingredient part we've talked about, very important. 
There was some, uh, you know, you could improve on the homogeneity of outcome measures and standardizing that. I don't think that was the hugest problem in this literature. It was really more what were the active ingredients, did they describe them, and then this issue of heterogeneity. And secondly, the power. So there might be a wonderful um, pilot trial, early signal, and if this was a drug study, you'd say, okay, let's go on to a phase three study, and that's where the, the research was it was like it just dropped off a cliff. And there could be a lot of reasons for that, but having a more coherent plan to follow through on early signals, kind of like they're doing with the whole translational research, right? An emphasis on saying if we have uh, some idea what's going on with mechanisms in animal studies, let's see what we can do to move that forward into um, uh, drugs that can be tested for efficacy. Um, <clears throat> On the way forward, a very important conclusion, nobody said that just because the evidence was limited, the committee didn't feel that that meant that there was no benefit. That it just often was just, it wasn't enough information to say one way or the other. And there certainly were signals of benefit. Um, and uh, so we supported the ongoing application, but also um, building on this literature base to think about how do you focus the research to really build on the signal that's already there, and follow it through in a meaningful way to decision makers. I'm not going to go through um, the specific recommendations about advancing the research. We can, but I think that's going to be for more discussion. And obviously, um, um, I think that we were, um, we felt like it was a very careful process. We really drilled down and we tried to look for where the signals are and felt that there was a lot of information also in the report about ways going forward. Thank you very much. Excuse me, I, I have a question. Um, my name is Jules DeLon and I am certainly not um, a clinical expert in this field. I'm a urologic surgeon by training, which is a quite a difference. And uh, I'm also an allocator of healthcare resources. And I would like to go back to, um, to your slide that was kind of the matrix, if you would, uh, with the little pluses and minuses. Because I think, for me, that tees up um, the real issue here. Um, I would like to believe that this collection of clinical interventions makes a, a big difference to people who have sustained traumatic brain injuries. But kind of uh, tailing on what Dr. Laquette's point was, my quandary is that when a very, very comprehensive and careful review of the literature is done, I think your review was wonderful and you went back to what, 1991? Uh, the, the committee's review went back to 1991. And in those intervening 20 years, we haven't been able to point to any of these interventions in the, in the realm of um, communication, social communication, which is what that one slide said, that presented any strong evidence for a long-term effect. Now, from my standpoint, I realize all the limitations that, that and, and how I may be oversimplifying this in great detail, but it seems that if these things work, then the imperative is a research agenda that proves that they work. And I don't understand um, I guess why, well, I do understand why that might not be present in the literature is because it's just taken that it works and nobody's felt a, com a compelling need to prove once and for all that these things work. But in going back and looking at the literature, uh, when I try to decide how to allocate money, I can't find those results and I can't find the data uh, that support that for the long term, over six months, any of these interventions make a meaningful impact. And I'm sure it's there, it's just 
that when I try to find it, I can't find it. So my plea as we go through the next uh, several hours would be that 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 be considered as one of the gaps that needs to be filled in. Uh, that, you know, if it works, we need to say that it, we need to be able to prove that it works. Uh, and I'm assuming that it works, so I just would, would plead for studies, for uh, research that proves it once and for all. Thank you. We, we certainly take your point, and in fact, the purpose of the workshop is to address many of these issues you brought up with the research agenda. I'm just concerned, though, that I want to be able to get to all the speakers and complete what we want to do before noontime. So if you have a question, uh, uh, you want to make a comment? Yeah. Could you make it very briefly? Just state your name. I and, promise. Yeah. Um, my name is Mary Radomski, and I want to, again, congratulate the group that did this really wonderful work. One of the things I especially appreciated is the delineation as to where there's evidence in cognitive rehabilitation for those with mild brain injury vo versus those with moderate to severe. And I guess one of the things I think would be important in this discussion over the next uh, day and a half, because my understanding is we're framing the discussion around the needs of service members. The largest number of service members with traumatic brain injury do have mild traumatic brain injury, concussion, or chronic effects of those issues. So as we're thinking about a, a research agenda, it might be well to differentiate those two populations because they're quite different. But so yeah. throwing it out. Point well taken and something we've been mindful of. Um, I, I think we should go on. I just want to, while Dr. Lockett's here, make one other point about our committee's deliberations, thematic issues. One concern that we have continued to have is about what are the active ingredients. We know the active ingredients in chemotherapy, as you point out, and a way of looking at that. So on the other hand, uh, in this era of trying to take interventions and personalize them, i.e. personalized medicine, in fact, cognitive rehabilitation therapy is almost the epitome of personalized medicine. It takes a technique that is personalized and then tries to generalize it. So I just wanted to make, at least in my mind, that important uh, distinction that we actually have personalized medicine and we're working the other way uh, in this regard. So I just wanted to get that in and maybe before you leave, get any comments you right. want to make? So again, nothing I said should be taken as being critical. Um, I'm just saying what are the, what are the concerns that I have, you know, in terms of how we move forward. I don't know what the answers are. I mean, I'm certainly not an expert in this field, so again, please don't take anything as being critical. I have these concerns. Is there a way that they can be addressed? Maybe not. I don't know. Um, but it, it's interesting. I think as a scientist, I understand everything that's being presented in terms of what the limitations of studies are, the difficulty of doing outcomes measures, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm at loss when these other issues come up that I have to address, and so I'm asking for your help, saying, okay, this is what they're asking Lockett. You know, the, the questions that I'm getting are not um, academic or what the research agenda should be. It's more, you know, questions of reimbursement, questions of um, effectiveness, so again, whatever you can do to offer to help me, again, it's not being critical of, of, of anything that was said. I, for one, as, as a scientist, appreciate the report and know the limitations of trying to do meta-analyses, trying to define your patient population, understanding the differences between mild and severe uh, TBI. Um, but then we would be preaching to the choir. So it's the, the other stuff that I'm just lost as to, as to how to address. So again, I thank you. Nothing again, um, it, it's a difficult charge, so 